。瓷器是历史的见证，是最日常的器物。Hello and welcome to the fourth part of my stories of Chinese porcelain. I am Tu Rei Ming, a craftsman and writer on Chinese porcelain based in Qingduoshan, China, known as the Porcelain Capital. I hope you are enjoying hearing my podcasts about porcelain. This time, I will talk about crackware, the typical Chinese export porcelain since the Ming Dynasty, and its influence on Europe and the world. Last year, I took my young son to visit the Shanghai Museum. I pointed out one porcelain plate to him and said, "Son, this type of plate has a special name. It's called crackware." Because Clark and Clark is the same pronunciation in Chinese, he got excited and replied, "Is this Superman's chinaware?" He loves the Superman movies and thought anyone called Clark is actually Superman. Since it sounds like a foreign name to the Chinese, this type of chinaware or porcelain is for sure related to Europe. In fact, this type of porcelain was very popular in Europe for hundreds of years. Ironically, it was not made in Europe but in China. But why does this Chinese porcelain have such a fancy Western name? And what on earth does it look like? We have to travel back in time to the Netherlands in 1602 to find out. On the 20th of March 1602, the Dutch East India Company was founded as a chartered company with monopoly rights for doing trade with Asia. Initially, as a government-backed military commercial enterprise, it was easier for the company to use force rather than fair trade to gain wealth and growth. In February 1603, the company seized the Santa Catarina, a 1,500-ton Portuguese merchant carrack near Singapore. The goods on the ship were sold by means of a so-called Dutch-style auction held in Amsterdam. The proceeds were so big. That the sales increased the company's capital by more than 50 percent. It was said to be worth 2.2 million guilders, equivalent to a few hundred houses in Amsterdam at that time. In today's money, that's around 36 million euros. One of the most important cargoes on the ship, in fact, was Ming Dynasty Chinese porcelain made for the export market. From then on, that type of Chinese porcelain was called Krak porcelain in Dutch, or Karak porcelain. That is the origin of the name Krak porcelain. The Dutch East India Company got a taste for wealth and opportunity, since pirating is not the most reliable source of securing supplies. The company went ahead to establish and expand regular trade between the East and West. It started to import Chinese porcelain, which was made in Qingdezhong, to Europe. It wasn't long before the volume of shipments reached hundreds of thousands per year. At its peak, the annual shipments of Chinese porcelain from China to Europe exceeded one million. You have to understand that at that time, the whole population of the Netherlands was only 1.5 million. The Dutch East India Company trade was not only supplying the Dutch domestic market, but also the entire European market. Fueled and supported by 16th and 17th century maritime trade, Chinese porcelain fever was widely spread across Europe. I need to say that in Chinese history before the Ming Dynasty, during the Song Dynasty in 960 to 1276, there was a sizable Chinese porcelain export trade to the world, but because of the transportation limitations, the scale and influence were far less than from the later 16th century. Before reliable maritime routes were developed, goods had to be transported manually across the vast land route from East Asia to Europe, passing through desert, mountains, and war-torn regions in order to reach their destination. Porcelain is fragile and would be easily damaged along the way. Before the 16th century, Chinese porcelain is so rare and precious in Europe that only royalty could afford to own it. Not even the upper classes could. Let alone the ordinary people. To most of the people at the time in Europe, the beautiful and magic chinaware was only a legend. The expansion of the trade and the stream of imports made Chinese porcelain more and more popular in Europe at that time, and people were dying to have it. It was so phenomenal that people even invented a word called porcelain krankheit, 
or porcelain sickness. Every household would be proud of having Chinese porcelain. Some even filled the entire room with various porcelain products. As I mentioned before, King Louis built a palace decorated with porcelain tiles nicknamed the Porcelain Palace. At that time in Europe, you would be out of touch with society if you did not have Chinese porcelain in your home. Being such a lucrative product, naturally the Europeans wanted to produce it by themselves, locally. In the Dutch city of Delft, people made some pottery that resembled Chinese porcelain. It had a similar look to Chinese blue and white porcelain, but the firing temperature was lower and the technique and materials were not the same. Also, the white colour is from the thin tin glaze and not from a white clay. Delft only made a lower-grade pottery. It was not porcelain at that time. But Delft pottery was still a huge success in Europe since it was a cheap alternative to the very expensive Chinese porcelain. To the ordinary people, owning Delft blue pottery that resembled Chinese porcelain was better than having nothing at all. Delft pottery is sometimes called Delft ware or Delft blue. It's still made now and is still popular in Europe. Though it's not a genuine porcelain product, the modern Delft handmade blue and white products are often more expensive than the handmade porcelain products from Qingde Chun. As a Chinese porcelain craftsman, I can't help feeling sorry about this situation. We talked so much about the origin of it, but what is the Krak porcelain? At that time, the Dutch just robbed the Portuguese Karak ship to get those valuable porcelain pieces. They did not know the name or source of the products. So the Dutch just called them Krak porcelain or Krak porcelain. They were, of course, Chinese export products made in the Ming dynasty and were mostly deep bowls and wide dishes. The products were decorated in ways that varied from the different styles which were used for the domestic Chinese market. Normally, at the centre of the object, you can see the more traditional Chinese motifs. From the centre towards the rim, following the radial line, the surface was divided into separate sections, almost all painted in the underglaze cobalt blue and white porcelain. That creates a common character for crack porcelain, as the surface of the porcelain decoration was around a centre, with obvious separate segments that would each have its own discrete image. So there was no strict definition of crack porcelain, but rather that it was a type of Chinese blue and white porcelain homeware modified to the European taste and design at a particular time in history. It did, however, tell us the story that between the 16th and 17th centuries, China was custom-making and exporting porcelain to the European market in large quantities. The crack porcelain fueled Europeans' porcelain sickness, but also stimulated Chinese porcelain production. As the world became more open and reachable, I can assure you that the Europeans are not the only ones that wanted to copy Chinese porcelain products. In the next episode, I will talk about how the Japanese Imari ware made its way to the world. Thanks for listening, and until then, goodbye for now. This has been a China Plus podcast. Original Chinese reading was by Sang Liang Chongdu, with English translation by Graham Stevens. If you like the show, please give us a rating and subscribe to us wherever you listen. If you've got any questions or feedback, please feel free to contact us via email at podcast at cri.com.cn or on Twitter at hashtag China Plus Pods.